And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest chit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have a newcomer to the temple. I'm a veteran of comic books and a veteran of, scre of screenwriting, has with ex with experience ranging from DC to IDW and and independence as well, ranging in the realm. Um, ah, geez, I screwed up my own intro. And then Iron Arctic Press, chief um, chief among those projects being Punchline, which I feel we're going to be taking a significant time on. The one and only Bill Williams. How are you doing today, man? I'm good. I somehow, in the middle of August slash September, managed to catch a chest cold. So, you know, yesterday I could barely talk, but when I was talking, I did the full Barry White voice, and now I got nothing. But you know, <laughs> Jeez, I, that... I may, I may, I may cough a little from time to time. Oh, uh, so you, you, you probably end up, you probably end up getting the same, um, the same, the same cold that I that I ended up getting on my birthday of all days <laughs> oh. back in August. Oh. The worst thing now during COVID is that if you sneeze or you cough and you're anywhere near anybody, they hit the deck like a firearm's gone off. You know, people just run every single direction. So it's a uh, it's a rough time to to you know have a summer flu. Yeah, I had I had to I had to tell I had to repeatedly tell everybody, I it's not the coof, it's just the common cold. Relax. Yep. It'll make your head stuffy. It won't kill you. Mm -hmm. And uh, and of course dealing dealing with that thing, I was already in a bad enough mood as it was. So I I said, it's bad enough that I have to deal with this, and you want to make it you want to make it worse by trying to invoke paranoia into this. Think people. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Well, paranoia is easy. It's easy to be afraid of things. Mm hmm. But. I'd like to open with with a bit of the humble beginnings, in a sense. Um, I realize this I realize this might be reaching a bit far back, but I'd like you to walk me through your your um first introduction to comic books, and and then we can go into um when the when and where the writing bug hit you. Oh, um, well, I am uh, I'm a bit older. So I started buying comics when they had a cover price of 20 cents. Uh, and I would be, uh, you know, that was there during the good slash old days of the spinner racks. So, you know, you would go to a convenience store and there'd be a rack of comics there. And uh, that's where I started reading comics. And it was, it was a, a time with a lot more variety because there was one Spider-Man book, you know, one Batman book, one mm -hmm. uh, Superman book. It was, you know, every month you got you got that little hit of uh, you know super powered adrenaline, and um, you went on from from there. There was there was also horror titles and war titles, and uh, it was kind of fun. It wasn't it wasn't a huge collectibles industry then. It was um, you know it was a way that publishers made money. Mm -hmm. I'm reading that uh, I'm reading Sean Howe's uh, uh, history of Marvel right now. And I'm up to the mid '80s, maybe early '90s, when Shooter's just been fired. But it's been, um, you know, that's kind of the the history of comics from start to finish. You know, just a bunch of guys trying to find a way to make a buck and sell a bunch of magazines. And uh, sometimes they get lucky, sometimes they don't. Mm -hmm. And um, it's interesting that you bring up Shooter when it comes to comic history because of how because of of how debatable of a figure that he that he is regarding regarding what regarding his alignment um, yeah well he uh you know i've been listening to to his to his story recently and i think that he's a guy who showed up you know after writing some some legion stories at dc and being more aligned with dc and marvel was uh kind of a big chaotic mess they had a whole bunch of editors in chief after Roy Thomas left. They had a whole bunch of guys rotating through there and Shooter showed up and did some things well and then it just kind of went to his head and um did not go well. You know, they 
it, it's one thing to have big ideas and to pitch big things and that's good but you know when you micromanage the artist and you know you see that fully come to fruition on shooters editorial reign at valiant where every shot's a medium shot you get these these you know you don't get extreme close-ups you don't get interesting panel designs you don't get these giant splash pages you get just uh I don't want to say boring storytelling, but, you know, he, he had an influence to, you know, make people draw differently. So the people that could afford to, they just didn't work for Marvel as long as he was there. Mm-hmm. Um, I think I do. Th- I think that he wasn't a, a suit, a suit, a suit kind of guy. And tr- and um, the funny, th- the funny thing is he stepped into a chaotic situation when it came to Marvel and, he left a he left a equally chaotic situation when it came to um, Valiant. Yeah, he uh, he Shooter left Marvel. I think in a lot of ways, maybe not in terms of artistic freedom, but in a lot of ways financially better than when he found it. Because in the early '80s, when he was you know, helping helping launch some of these big projects, it was the early days of the direct market. Mm-hmm. So the direct market boomed and they sold Uncanny X Men like crazy. They sold Secret Wars comics like crazy. And, you know, they kept trying to repeat the thing that had just worked for them. And you would end up getting projects like Secret Wars two, which was, you know, as as structurally bad as the first one was, it was a novelty and it was kind of cool. And the Secret Wars too it just got awful. Um, so you know, it's it's one of those things where you have to keep, you know, you have to find a way to try to stay humble, and you have to try to find a way to repeat yourself, but not in exactly the same way. You know, you you give people what they want, but not in the way they expect it. You know, it's uh, it's trying trying to make, you know, trying to make fans happy. I think I think that Shooter probably still has some stuff that he could do in the world of comics, but I'm not sure that anybody wants to work with him anymore. You know what I mean? Which is a, which is a tough spot because there's a lot of people that that felt pretty burned by him uh, mm-hmm. going through the all the all the stuff that that they went through with him at Marvel, and then a couple of new generations of guys I know uh, I know I actually inked backgrounds on a, on one of the Defiant books, and I worked with a guy who had gone on to work it and do a couple of years on one of the books at Valiant, and you know I don't think that they would work with him in a freelance on a freelance basis, but I think if he showed up with a check, you know, every freelancer is going to listen to that generally. Mm -hmm. Um, Of course, I would, I would say that, um, the, I think the, I think the other thing that I find, I find a bit amusing is a lot of the stuff that he was pushing during those Valiant days were things that he, um, he grew up with because he was a big fan of gold key comics. Yep. And a lot of the IPs that he grabbed were ones that were on that late, on that particular label. Um, and when it came to that whole pushing the envelope, the um, I'd say the big the big example of that was the um, Unity experiment. Yes. Yeah, those uh, those gold key characters had been out there for a while, and that's the kind of the the, the weird double edged sword aspect of some of these uh, very old IPs is like uh, for for Punchline we we were talking with the guys uh, or our publisher was talking for us <coughs> just talking with the uh, with the guys at uh, Dynamite mm-hmm. about doing a Vampirella crossover and I was like well while that would be cool we would do a whole lot of work Dynamite would get most of the cash and I'm not sure you know how many long-term fans we'd come with out of it i mean you know it's it's cool that people every few years decide to relaunch zorro or the lone ranger or magnus or solar or some of these things but you know the guys that were big fans of those books they're senior citizens now Hmm. so you've got to consider what those properties are really worth yeah i mean if you want to make a uh if you want to make magnus a big name property you would find a way to sell that as a show on Netflix, then would, then people would give a crap about it. But in the meantime, it's like, well, that's that's a cool that's cool IP you got there, but you know, nobody cares. What's it really worth? Yeah. And 
Now, I, w I will I will admit that um for a few co for a few colleagues of mine they got into they ended up getting back into Flash Gordon because of the um because of the R because of the RPG that came that came out not too long ago. Yeah. Um same thing same thing goes with um jo with John Carter, but those are very special circumstances. In the case of Carter, well it had well it had it had something more mainstream with the film, but we don't talk about that film. <laughs> yeah, people people hated it. I've got a friend who's the biggest Edgar Rice Burroughs fan in the world, and I still haven't seen that movie yet because you know it just it wasn't my thing. But you know, if I mean, if you're looking at things from a modern perspective as a creator, uh, if you look at what George Lucas did, he took a little bit of Flash Gordon and mixed it with a couple of other things and came up with Star Wars, and you know, rather than doing Star, rather than doing Flash Gordon, why wouldn't you take your favorite parts of that and mix that with some favorite parts of other stuff and, and come up with your own take on it and sell that rather than saying, you know, Hey, we're going to make the, the biggest flash Gordon book ever, you know, mm -hmm. that, that still has a ceiling on it where if you say, I'm going to make my own IP and it's going to be a little flash Gordon, it's going to be a little Romeo and Juliet and it's going to be full of wacky monsters. And I'm going to call it saga. I yeah. mean, you know, that's, that's a much better approach if you're an independent creator making an IP rather than saying, I'm going to go get the rights to the Flash Gordon. You know, it's more like, oh, maybe I can bring the spirit of that to something else. Yeah, and I will, and as as somebody who's um who's who's dipped into the history of T of TSR, another 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 instance of this whole br of this whole bringing in an IP thing that um, immediately comes to mind was. The RPG adaptation of um, Buck Rogers in the 25th century. Yeah. Which, um, I obviously, uh, obviously, I'm I, I was born in '87, so I'm so I don't have firsthand knowledge of this, but I look at I look at where science fic I look at where science fiction was in 1982. Mm -hmm. Arguably, arguably one of the greatest years for science fiction of all uh, when it came to film of all time. And I and I have to ask myself, who would who would even know who Bu who Buck Ro who Buck Rogers was, or or not? Ni I was in 1982. I was I think it was like 80. Um, I think it was like 88 or something. But the point is, who would who would really know who Buck Rogers was in the 80s? There would be people who would be able to look back on that Buck Rogers show from uh, with Gil Gerard in it, mm -hmm. and say, "Hey, it's the guy who wore the white suit, right?" I mean, you know, it would be. Uh... You'd have people people hitting that touchstone, but you know back then, you'd get a much more you know light going off in people's eyes if you started talking about Blade Runner, which you know it's um, you know people really swim in the in the media environment that 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 we build for them. Mm -hmm. So you know some of these uh, antique IPs just you know they've fallen out of favor and people haven't gotten a really good handle on them, mostly because rather than spending your own money on on you know renting the IP and doing something with it, most people would just decide to go out and create something new, which is, you know, good if you're a creator, but bad if you're holding these these old IPs and you think you're sitting on a gold mine. It's like, well, you may be sitting on a pile of fool's gold. Uh, I think that I think that there I think that when it comes to some when it comes to some of those old IPs, there there is a way to there is there is a way to build it back up, but the key thing is. Rome wasn't built in a day, and just because just because you having just because you have a name that was that w that was a bigger deal at one point doesn't mean you can just bring it back and then you'll and then you'll get this magic wave of people to um, come in. I like to call this kind of thing the greener grass fallacy. Yeah, um, I agree. I mean, DC did a very long run on a very clever uh, Scooby-Doo comic book that was set firmly within the DC universe. And Scooby kept running into all these, uh, you know, more or less mainstream superhero types. And it was a really entertaining book, but it was aimed at kids. Mm -hmm. And, you know, adults found no reason to, to look at it. And, you know, it was, it's one of those books that was, it was drawn in the style of a kid's book, but it wasn't written to just kids. So, you know, it's that that's part of your publishing plan when you start out, you know, you in a lot of in a lot of ways, if you're doing a corporate gig like that, you start out by talking about your market and your audience, and, and reverse engineering it from there. Instead of just saying, you know, maybe I'm going to make the most awesome comic book I can imagine, and hopefully we can, you know, 
once it's done, we, once we see what we've actually got on paper, then we can go out and maybe pitch it to an audience. Mm -hmm. But when it comes now, also when, when it came to the whole crossover thing, um, something that immediately comes to mind when it comes to the logistics of crossovers was the, um, that attempt, that, that Valiant Image um, crossover attempt, Deathmate, that was just a absolute disaster. It was, it was one of those things that if nobody bought it, it wouldn't be considered a huge disaster. You know, they, they made those books and they had kind of a high cover price for the, for the thing at the time and the covers were foil and then they didn't sell. And, you know, if you sell 100,000 copies of something now, you look like a genius. But, you know, if you, if you deliver 200,000 copies to the direct market and you only sell 100,000 copies, then you've got people freaking out. You know, it's a, it's a question of scale. You mm -hmm. know, can you uh, get people interested and get them to, to, you know, communicate with the thing that you're making for them? And, uh, you know, can you make it work? And in some cases... There are things that are financial failures, you know, for no good reason. Then there are things that are financial failures because they're also artistic failures. And, you know, people can just figure these things out as they're as they engage with that stuff while it's still on the shelf. Mm -hmm. Now, with that with that kind of thing in mind, um, what what gave you what gave where. I'd like you to walk me through the moment where where the idea of um, becoming a writer, whether it be whether it be screenwriting or co or comics, really um, really started to for form in your in your head. Well, uh, I started out wanting to make comics, mm -hmm. and that was just kind of a uh, a a broad goal. You know, it wasn't focused enough to be kind of successful. So I did some sample pages, and I had penciled and inked those, and I took those with me to a show in the late '80s in uh, in New York. They had fairly frequent shows there, and it was before, you know, it was a few years before the the the, the convention scene exploded. I mean, there were San Diego shows there, there were Chicago shows, but uh, you know, New York was a was a huge show because. You know, it was in the heart of the of the comic book publishing world at the time. So I took my portfolio. I was, you know, I made a road trip. I was hanging with a buddy of mine, and uh, I showed my pages to a, to a few people. And the person who gave me advice that stuck was Marshall Rogers, and he said, "You know, I can't tell what you're trying to do here. Do you want to be a penciler or an inker? Because you can't be both." And I said, "Well, I think maybe I should be an inker." He says, "All right, then do this, do that, and do the other." And that was the advice I took to heart. Now, maybe maybe that was good advice. Maybe that was bad advice. But I would not give anybody that advice now because if you're penciling, you can always work. If you're an inker, you, it, and unless you're great, you have a hard time getting work. But, um, you know, I took that advice and I went back to Texas and I was working on, uh, working on these sample pages and I'm, you know, I just done sample page after sample page after sample page. And it was pissing me off. And I said, you know, as many as many sample pages if I'd done, I just put if I just put some some story to this, I would I would be making comics. I'm like, oh, that's not a terrible idea. So I uh, wrote out a a very short script, and I talked to the person that I had traveled up to uh, up to the New York show with. There's a guy named Philip Anderson who is a big com comic book art dealer. And I said, you know, who are your like top two or three or four guys that you know that are pencilers that would do an indie thing and that who are basically otherwise, you know, not really working a whole lot or working kind of off and on. And he sent me to he gave me the contact info for a guy named Rob Phipps, who had drawn some things for um, he drawn some mantra comics for who was it Malibu or whoever, whoever published those things. And uh, he was a nice guy. And I talked to Rob about it, and you know I was paid him a page rate, paid a letterer, inked it, started making pages, and uh, you know I looked up, and and there I was writing comics. Mm -hmm. 
Now, with now with that with that kind of thing in mind, um, that whole that whole that whole thing you that whole thing you had mentioned about um about about the st about the nature of of old IP, of old IPs and the like, um, yeah, was was that was one of, was that kind of thing a factor in the creation of punchline? Not really. Um... I had been doing web comics because they're a very direct way to reach out to your audience. You know, mm -hmm. if you have a pencil and a piece of paper and you can sketch something and get it up online this afternoon, you're making web comics. Um, well, I went to a there's a there's a store here in Austin called Dragon's Lair, mm -hmm. and once upon a time they had a big. Um, they had a big web comics rampage, what they called it, and they brought in web comic pe web comic people from all over the world, and uh, they would sit down and you know people would walk by their little their little booths and you know they'd talk to us and buy stuff and we'd hang out for the for like a day or two and um, I got at the first one of those I sat next to two people, I sat next to Ryan North who did the dinosaur comics who has since gone on to do the. Uh, uh, I guess the Squirrel Girl comics and some other stuff. Very nice guy, very Canadian, very stereotypically amazingly polite guy, and, and funny. You know, and I, I really enjoyed his dinosaur comics. Uh, he got the most that he could out of the kind of you know stock photo and long dialogue format for for web comics. And the other guy I was sitting next to was Matt Weldon, and Matt ended up being my partner on Punchline. And I looked over and I I see the stuff that's just coming right out of Matt's pen and I'm thinking, holy f this guy can draw, you know, and um, all of those things are still true. So I said, you know, hey, let's. I'm a writer. I'm always trying to launch new things. You know, I've been been there and done that a couple of times. If you'd like to work on something, he said sure. And then um, I didn't see him for like a couple of years. I ran into him at a show in. Uh, Houston and he was working with a guy on this book called plus ultra and mm -hmm. it was drawn very well and I hadn't seen any of them. And, you know, I eventually read them and eh, not, not a whole lot of, uh, I'm not going to say anything about the script because I really don't have a whole lot positive to say, but you know, it's a really pretty book. And Matt said that he was interested in doing something else. I said, okay, so, I showed. I, I thought about it for a while, and one of the things that you do when you're coming up with, essentially, when you're trying to come up with something, when you're writing a um, a long form piece of piece of drama, is you need something that's a story engine, something that you that's going to you know kick out stories, you know, every week if you're trying to write a, a TV series or something like that. So I I went back on a classic, a, a tried and true thing where I took you know, a mismatched couple of people who have to work on something together and they would be kind of spatting with each other while they're uh, fighting bad guys. So I came up with Mel, who is a greatest generation superhero who works for an organization called the Daughters of Hercules. But Mel's been doing it since the 40s and she's such a pain in the ass that they just can't take her anymore at some level. So... They fire her. And typically when somebody passes along their powers, they kinda that's kind of a kind of a willing <laughs> a willing moment there. Um so they kind of, you know, maneuver Mel into the point where she, you know, has to has to quit and pass on her job to somebody else. And the somebody else who gets the, the gig is a teenager named Jesse McGrath, who takes Mel's place and becomes a character way more like supergirl you know tall blonde bulletproof you mm -hmm. know smart resourceful all these things and it you know, the first first year is her grown into her abilities but the the heart of the thing that i like to write is the greatest generation and the millennial kid you know kind of arguing style points while they're fighting with bad guys and it's kind of a you know kind of a classic odd couple situation so mm -hmm. you know when i when I talked with Matt, I pitched him a couple of things. I said, well, I've got this thing about a superhero that gets fired, blah, 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 blah. And he just looked at me. I said, I've also got this other thing. And I pitched that. 
I said, okay, let's go back to the superhero thing. So, <laughs> you know, I, I, uh, we talked and I, I went and I wrote uh, a little 13 page chapter that starts with Mel has taken a, an apparently mortal wound and she's got to pass on her superpowers before she dies. And she passes them on to this kid and to Mel's surprise, she doesn't pass on because, which is, which is how she got the powers in the first place. But mm -hmm. it's, uh, she's like, well, I guess I'm going to stick around and train this kid while I try to figure out what the hell's going on. And we started making those comics and we made, uh, about three issues worth of stuff. And then, you know, we opened up a chap instead of just putting them up online and up on comiXology, you know, we ended up talking with the uh, Antarctic press about the book. And now I know, I know, Antar I know Antarctic press is a, is a pretty, is a pretty major name in, um, in Texas and in particular the San Antonio area. If I'm, if I'm recalling correctly, um, if, That's true. If if I if I was if I was off on the area, I apologize in advance because obviously I'm not from Texas. Um, no, they're they're longtime San Antonio guys. Mm -hmm. They've been there uh, forever. Mm -hmm. But how how did you were were you familiar with Antarctic Press before beforehand? Were were they was it something that was recommended to you? And how did you um, get in contact with them? Well, I I've known uh, Joe and Ben Dunn for the longest time because. Mm -hmm. I'm in a writing group with a bunch of other uh, cartoonists and guys. And one of, one of the guys that I hang out with from time to time is Bill Willingham. And uh, before Fables uh, relaunched Bill's career, uh, the guys at AP were saying, hey, you know, we'll, we'll publish whatever you want to put out. You know, let's talk about doing something. And that never, that never seemed to happen. But, I, mm -hmm. you know, I'd, I'd had lunch with them a couple of times. They're, they're nice guys. Um, but, you know, no, no deal ever happened out of that. So... Um, I've known Brian Denham for a long time and he's the editor in chief over there. And, you know, we've been making these, these comics and we've been putting them up online and people liked them, but we weren't really getting any traction. So Brian reached out and he said, you know, I think we're going to have a, a spot in our publishing schedule. Do you want to come down to one of our Monday meetings? I said, well, sure. Mm -hmm. Um, I found out late when the meeting was and, you know, I, got on the road and Austin isn't too far from San Antonio, but it's a very dense active corridor. So I showed up in the middle of their meeting and the, the warehouse office space that they were in at the time was very small. So I walked into this tiny little office, you know, I knock on the door and open, walk in, Brian says hi and all this stuff. And I look around, it's a small room. And there's probably 12 people in there. They all look at me like, why the f are you here? I waved and shut up and leaned against the wall until people talked. And eventually, you know, they, they talked around the rest of their business. And they came back around and looked at me for a second. And I said, uh, Brian said, you might have a, a spot on your schedule. I'm writing a book called Punchline. Uh, it's about mismatched super types fighting crime. It's kind of like, what if... Um, of Supergirl was trained was was trained by a you know angry super spy. Mm -hmm. It's a lot like that. It's kind of like Modesty Blaze meets Supergirl, and they work together fighting crime. So they're like, okay, how far along are you? I said, well, and I I'd prepared, so I said, well, here's here would be like the first three issues, uh, and I handed them the black and whites on that, and uh, or the the color print, or I forget which which version of that I took, and they looked at it and they were like, no. Well, this doesn't suck. Okay, <laughs> that'd be good. So, <coughs> so we made a deal for for that first trade paperback, uh, the length of that, and that was we made a deal for issues one through five, mm -hmm. and we just finished up thirteen, and that's going over to them, uh, I think, with sometime this next week. Yeah. So, and um, don't. Don't worry. Don't worry about. Whole... I I always I always have to tell I always have to tell this to people, but um, you don't have to worry. You don't have to worry about about whether or not F, about um whether or not you need to hold back on f bombs here in the yeah. here in the temple. Um, I do like throwing f bombs. I'm trying to be uh, trying to have a little more st restraint there. I mostly just throw that whenever I'm either driving or angry, and the the, the driving is usually angry. So you know. That's when I throw a couple of fucks around. 
I oh I oh I know I've um I've seen I've seen things. Yeah. I'll put I'll um put I'll put it that way. <laughs> oh. I got gotcha. you. But what I do find it I do find it interesting that you used uh, that when you were giving examples and you uh, when it came to your pitch you used um you used Supergirl in that in that instance since yeah now ov obviously interpretations are gonna be different gonna be different depending on on who's on who's writing what but I've always I've always seen su I've always seen Supergirl as the um the member the member of the super family who did who couldn't quite fit in. Yeah. Well, you know, she's kind of treated like an appendage. You know, it's like, what if Superman was a girl? You know, instead of having her own identity for a lot of stuff. And in our case, it's kind of an easy analog because, you know, she's uh, tall and blonde and, you know, has something that sort of looks like a cape and she flies around and punches things. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, whenever I think of things regarding kind of a, uh, a power set... That's the kind of thing I think of, you know, for for Mel to try to stay active because she's kind of an adrenaline junkie. She will, from time to time, just take up a position and be a sniper. Now, there's, you know, unless you're in wartime, I'm not sure there's a heroic way to be a sniper in an urban environment. But, uh, yeah, she doesn't really care. She really doesn't care about anybody else's rules except that the rules that she likes and the, and the, the way that she lives her life. So... Mm -hmm. You know, I, I have a much easier time writing Mel because she's much, in my case, she's much more entertaining. And I, I sometimes struggle a little bit to make sure, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm writing a teenage kid well. You know, if you go back and you look at uh, like DC and Marvel in the 60s and 70s, mm -hmm. trying to write teenage characters, you <laughs> just have god-awful dialogue and god-awful stuff. And, you know, I'm trying to find a way to, you know, put myself into somebody else's head and not sound like a total goof the entire time I'm doing it. So it's, it's, I struggle, struggle a little bit more with, uh, with writing Jess, Jesse's dialogue. Yeah. Although to be fair, um, comic, write comic writing in the superhero comic writing in the sixties, that's still knee deep in the silver age, which means, which means I'd say, um, I'd say trying to write kids as kids is the least, it was the least, um, cringy part of that era. The, big, the bigger offender is the fact that, look, I know I know that a good chunk of the writers who may, who may have who may have been writing um, for the big two in the '60s will claim that they were not on any drugs whatsoever. I don't buy that for a minute. <laughs> no, that's not true at all. I mean, that's like I you know to fall back on this Marvel book, they talk about the uh, the epic use of uh, mind expanding drugs. While you know guys are are working on uh, books with Adam Warlock and Captain Marvel and Doctor Strange and mm -hmm. you know that that kind of work has its place. I don't uh, I don't have a problem with that. But you know what I want to avoid is slang that gets dated very quickly, right? Great. Now, you're, is... now you got me thinking of the, of the 2099 books that tried to predict Ugh. future slang. <laughs> you can't do that. I mean, nobody would have thought that we'd have access to the entire informational output of the entire world on a little thing the size of a giant credit card that we carry around in our pockets. You know, the closest they got was the 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 memory or data chips that they had in the original Star Trek show. You know, now. You know, we, we can reach the entire world from our cell phones, and we mostly spend our time playing stupid-ass video games or watching cat videos. But uh. there, there's, a, uh, there's an Aquaman issue from the original Silver Age run where Aquaman, Mera, and Aqua Baby find out that Fu Manchu is still alive and he's been sailing around under the world or Genghis Khan or somebody. He's been sailing around in the oceans, you know, for 100 years. And they run into each other, and for some reason the bad guy ages up Aqua Baby, who falls in love with his, you know, hundreds of years old daughter. So when Aqua Baby finds out exactly who these people are, and he says he he talks to Aquaman and he says, "Heck, pops, I'd never get hitched to a chick that old." And you know, whenever I'm thinking just misfitting dialogue that's mm -hmm. the first thing that i think about i'm like you know i don't want to i don't want to write dialogue that just sounds like 
you know, total shit in two years. So I, I try to just, just keep things on a human relatable level there. Yeah. And speaking of that, Punchline is a comic that ha- that has the generational gap as one of its major themes, but whenever when whenever there's that sort of conflict in in a lot of stories, um, for some for some authors there's the tendency to ultimately pick ultimately pick one ultimately pick one side as the right one. Yeah. Um, which um. Sometimes, which sometimes can work, but when you have when you have a debate with any sort of complexity, it's generally not advisable. Um, how um, how do you make sure to avoid to avoid that kind of thing? So it's so it's not a case where um, where the story is clearly taking Mel or Jesse's side. Well, I try to have characters have a reason for what they're doing, mm-hmm. and I don't want to. You know, Mel's a big fan of situational ethics, and Mel does not have a really big rogues gallery because she just fucking puts a bullet in somebody and feels like she's saved the taxpayer a big bunch of money. And it's, you know, Jesse says, well, you know, if you just kill bad guys all the time, you don't get a chance, you don't give them the chance to redeem themselves. And Mel says, you ever met somebody who wants to be a better person and actually pulls it off? She just thinks that people, people are basically incapable of it. You know, and there, there are things that, you know, if, if Mel started fighting crime during World War II, starting with Nazis and then working her way on across from there, she's had a lot of experience with these people. So I try not to put my thumb on the scale mm-hmm. for for one character or another. But in in the fifth issue, they break up a drug distribution warehouse and beat up a, a bunch of people and uh, end up with a bunch of loot. And Mel just packs a bag. She's like, well, I got a bunch of their intel, and I got a big stack of cash. I think we're done. The kid says, we're not stealing stuff. <laughs> Mel says, I beg your pardon? She said, no, we're going to stand around and talk with the cops. And Mel's like, yeah, fine. You you just go ahead and do that. I'll, uh, I'll meet you at the rendezvous point. See you around. You, you, this will be instructional for you. So you see, you know, there's a time jump after that. And I think the caption reads, much, much, much later. <laughs> Uh, Versima, who is Jesse's alter ego, is explaining things to the cops one more time. You know, and like, you know, let me let me go over this one more time. And, uh, you know, then an FBI agent shows up and there's a long conversation with her. And, you know, Mel looks at mechanisms of the state as time wasters and inefficient. And all they do is talk and fill out reports. They don't ever actually fucking do anything. So she spends her time actually going out and, you know, putting bullets in bad guys and solving problems. And then she basically looks at it like it's an administrative task that she leaves behind for those guys. And she has no fucking interest in that. Mm -hmm. So, you know, there's a they have a difference in point of view. And I think that if I had to say anybody is right in this world, it's probably that Mel is more right. Because, you know, if you work with a bunch of people, like say you work with a bunch of people in their 50s and 60s, they have a certain mindset. They're just not willing to break out of that mindset, and that's who they are, and that's it for them. I mean, you have to give people the option to change, which is the part that Jesse gets right, you know? So, uh, you know, Mel's basically, she's just drawing on, you know, 60, 70 years of experience where the kid thinks she knows everything because you know, every new generation thinks that they know everything because they think that their parents are stupid. Mm-hmm. So, uh, you know, I, I try to keep that, that, that give and take in place, but it, uh, it comes to a head in an upcoming, upcoming story where, you know, somebody finds out Jesse's secret identity and uses it against her. And Mel just says, you know, if you don't, if you don't let me kill this person, this is just never going to stop. You know, you can live the rest of your life on the run if you want, or you can let me do what I do. And mm-hmm. uh, Jesse says, no, if I have ethics that change when it, when the situation changes, they're not really ethics. They're more just a fashion statement. And Mel says, well, I respect your point of view. You're totally wrong, but I respect it. Mm-hmm. So, uh, you know, there's a, I, I try to keep, you know, a certain tension there and give every side of the argument a chance to be right. You know, kind of depending on the situation. Yep. And 
with within that because which is an it is a um important setup with with those sort of debates that both are both are right and both are wrong instead of um picking one side which is an easy trap to easy trap to fall into well rather than lecturing the audience you give them a chance to decide mm -hmm. this person's right that person's right rather than saying you know it, you know I'm, I'm writing comics not a twitter debate where if you look around on Twitter, it's, you know, people rending their garments and saying, unfriend me now if you disagree with me on anything at all, ever. You know, it's like, oh, it's a kind of a stupid way to go through life. But, uh, you know, in, in comics, I get to, I don't want to say have it both ways, but I get to show both sides of the argument. Mm -hmm. And, the, and of, co of course, the, of course, that's the, that's the kind of thing that's going to stand, because that whole, that whole unfriend me if you disagree, um, the end goal. The end goal of that. The end. The not the end goal, but the end point of that is, um, as I've called it, the kingdom of one. Yeah, you're preaching to the converted. It's like, of course, they agree with you. You've handpicked your your audience. It's much more interesting to reach out and influence an audience of people who don't already show up to the party agreeing with you. Well, what I mean by the kingdom of of one is event is eventual eventually. It's not. It's never enough, and the cir the circle of people that of e people that agree with that person on every little thing will get smaller and smaller and smaller until the only person that agrees with them is themselves. Yeah, which is kind of an awful party, you know. <laughs> party of party one's kind of a joke. Mm -hmm. You know, there's no surprises when it's just you, you know, agreeing with yourself. You can only you can only play solo RPGs for so long. It's true. Besi besides, you besides you know the old adage: never split the party. True. <laughs> That's when people die, you know, in the yeah. RPG games. Yeah. But with but with that kind of thing in mind, I um, I do rem I do remember when I met you at Ka at Cowtown, we ended up having a bit we ended up having a bit of a discussion regarding um. Regarding our relative experience with superhero RPGs, and yeah, because and the reason I bring that kind of thing up is because that particular style has always been has always been a bit downstream from from the way comics have developed in one form or another. I mean, both Marvel and DC have had their entries, and of course, the bigger one didn't have a whole lot of association with either in the form of um, Champions. Yeah, um, but. In but in your in your ex, in your experience, um, were th were th I've seen I've had some I've had some writers um use use the RPG end of the equation as testing ground for characters and ideas that they may use in um stories. Did that kind of thing ever happen? Um, not really, because writers lie, cheat, and steal. <laughs> and you know you can you can screw your character with a bad dice roll you know there's there's ways to kind of you know spin the game that you've got in progress uh one of the guys that i play in a uh play an rpg crew group with is jack herman who's one of the two guys he and jeff d created the villains and vigilantes game mm -hmm. i know jeff and yeah jeff's a nice guy mm -hmm. and uh, anyway, I, I I think that we will probably put out V and V versions of some of our characters, and we'll probably run that in the backs of the comics because the I guess the third edition V and V game has very specific skill sets, and I think that that's more interesting than just saying you know this person can lift a building. Mm -hmm. You know, I I find it more interesting to have. I think you get better drama when you have a when you have your lead character bumping up his limitations all the time. Yeah, um, especially especially since because of the big uh, the big elephant in the room when it comes to when it comes when it comes to trying to handle R, um, superheroes and RPGs is the fact that trying to do it. I I think I said this to you before. Trying to do a rules light supers game is going to run into problems. Sim simply because of all the simply because of all the stuff you have to account for. Yeah, and you know, there's there's another problem with it too because 
you know, when I was reading comics in the 70s and 80s, Batman was a pretty skilled athlete and a pretty smart detective. And now, you know, he's just every other character's worst nightmare. Power creep. How do, yeah. How do you maintain a fictional universe when you've got a guy with no superpowers who can kill anybody else on the planet? And, you know, if you if you stretch that to RPGs, how do you build an RPG system where you have a fair representation of Superman, Green Lantern, Batman, the question all at the same time, you know, because in theory, you know, in two rounds, you got one dude standing, you mm -hmm. know, uh, when most, when most creative fiction has, you know, a lot of drama between these characters running into each other in RPG is just, you know, you meet on the rooftop, this guy goes over the edge and he's a bloody red stain at the, at the pa at the basement there, you know, mm -hmm. so there's just, uh, it, it's hard it's one of those things that's very hard to manage in the world of uh, to, to to make RPGs fit the crazy shit that happens in superhero comics. Yeah, and when it comes to uh, that brings that brings up an interesting thing because um, a ver a issue that an issue that I've had just running diff running different types is is having is having to have people of different essentially different scalings but still have still have them be able to work alongside each other the extra the ex and there's this takes there's two examples i can always think of when it comes to this one is main is keeping say street level heroes street level even even late even much later on in the campaign when they've amassed a a um a good amount of exp of experience yeah and the other, the other is make, is making it so, um, you have in the comics you can have, say Spider Man and the and the Hulk on relative on relatively even footing with each other, or be able or be able to go somewhat toe to toe with each with each other with without with um without it being completely one one sided, well to an, yeah. to an extent. And I use that's obviously an extreme case, but. Having having these diff having these diff having these wildly different um, sources still be somewhat synergistic with each other is one is a challenge. True, I think the one way that those could work though, and this would be, you know, kind of an anti-hero kind of game. Mm -hmm. But if you set up a, a role-playing game that was essentially the Suicide Squad, uh, I just saw that second movie and it's outstanding. And, uh, you know, if you set up a game like that where, yeah, you're going to be playing a, a super type, you're going to be going up against bad guys, and you're essentially a villain at heart. Mm -hmm. um, and if you die, you roll up a new character. So, you know, there's there's room in there to do uh, kind of some interesting, you know, unique takes on things. Mm -hmm. You know, there there are things where... So I'm working on a project about a character time shifted from the 40s up to now mm -hmm. and he's a kind of a, a twin 45s shooter and to do that back then i think you could probably get away with it now now you know every policeman has to keep track of where his every bullet goes you know you can't have somebody you know chasing somebody through a mall and you know trying to trying to wing a flying suspect with his 45 you know there's just there's a whole lot of things that sort of work in the world of fiction and then when you think about it a couple of minutes you're like yeah that's not going to work at all yeah <coughs> um it's fun when you met when you mentioned suicide squad i i will um the game that immediately came to mind is have, have you ever heard of a project called necessary evil no um that was a that was a super um adaptation using the savage worlds engine the base the base idea of of the thing of the setup is the her the heroes have lost the villains have the villains have taken over then um then aliens show up and they and they want to and they want to take over the planet and the vi and the villains are like you're not taking over the planet that's our that's we got we are in this we stole this thing fair and square yeah dibs <laughs> uh and bec and because of that, there's the built-in assumption that the that um that the player characters are super villains in some in some form. Yeah. 
that's fine, you know. Uh, turns out being a hero and being a villain and being just human, mm-hmm. it all has a scale. Yeah. You know, you have good days, you have bad days. You know, some days you're on the cover of Newsweek. Some days they're trying to arrest you for some shit you didn't do. I mean, it's just, uh, you know, the, the hero and villain label works in, in some environments. But in fiction, I'm not sure that that is super super helpful i mean if you look at the entirety of like marvel's villain universe is there a single villain left at marvel who wasn't also a hero at some point i think they're even trying to redeem kang for some reason you know and i'm I'm just sitting here going (sighs) event i'm on my sunday podcast i'm probably i i have a slot planned later this year where i'm going to delve into it just called um just called sympathy for our devils because i like the stones so yeah 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 <laughs> um but that but that is a that is a bit of a that is a bit of a trend that's become a that's become a pet peeve of the idea of the idea of tr- of trying to trying to rede- trying to redeem um villains or tr- or trying to or trying to pull the trying to pull the um sad backs Trying to give a sad backstory to villains who, don't, who very clearly don't um, don't ne- don't want or need it, and I think Kang no, is. No, it it, it, it it you know it, it it waters down the villain. It's like, mm-hmm. oh, you know, six months ago you were saying death to everybody that disagrees with me, and now because we find out that your dad punched you around and bounced you off the wall, we're supposed to have sympathy for you. No, that doesn't do anything for all the people that you personally killed. Yeah. You know. It's uh, it's one of those things where you, you're not going to be able to outgrow some of the actions that you've done. You know, some of the terrible things that you've done, you just can't take back the way that you affect people. So, you know, to an extent, I think that once somebody's kind of in the villain category, they really have to move heaven and earth, almost literally to, to you know, to end up on the other side. But it's, yeah. you know, how many times has Magneto been the good guy or the bad guy? You know, although in in the there are some there are some times where it can work, but the thing is, the thing is is that it can is that it should only really be able to work um, temporarily. Yeah. And in in the case of in the case of giving a if you'll excuse if you'll excuse me for making a wrestling reference face turn for Magneto yeah. or for Emma Frost, mm-hmm. the wrong way the wrong way to do it is just to ha- is just to have them be a good guy. The right way to do it is for the is for them to. It is for it to be very clear that this is that this is not a easy thing for them to do. It f- it's it's like a left hander trying to pit, trying to pitch right handed. Yeah, I would make the the argument that it's easier for Emma Frost to be a hero than Magneto because Emma Frost always seemed to me to be more about power and and personal power mm-hmm. as much as anything else and personal influence and if she could do it working with the brotherhood that's one thing if she could do a better job of that working with x-men i don't think she really cares so i think that that there's a mercenary aspect of her character that's interesting but when you have somebody who's committed to wiping wiping out humans who are trying to kill him it's really harder to to you know whitewash uh, magneto and make him a uh, make him a villain because it's like you know you were trying to kill these people last month you know, stop, stop pretending. Yeah, um, I will, I will, ad- I will admit that, <laughs> um, when that some some um a while a while back someone had, someone had asked me how I how I would have written how I would have written a Loki series if um if I if I had been if I had been in charge of it and I said, you if you remember the TV show My Name Is Earl, basic basically <laughs> that <laughs> I would I that would, would go, be funny. I would go, yes, I w- I would write it as a com- comedy, but um, the ho- but if we're if we're going to acknowledge the fact the fact that that everybody knows that that Loki is not to be trusted, um, play along with that and just have it of it of him just have the idea of him trying to be a good guy. He's just very 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 bad at it, and nobody's yeah. by and no, you have a combination of him being bad at it. Bad, um, bad luck, and ev- and everybody, lo- and even when he tries, a lot of people are looking at him like going, "Okay, what's the con?" <laughs> yeah, what's your next move? I keep waiting for that other shoe to show up. Yeah, 
Uh, yeah, I read the. Uh, there's a pretty entertaining book called The Gospel According to Loki, mm-hmm. and that that Loki uh, narrates Norse mythology from his point of view, where he's the star of the show, of course. And it's um, it's an entertaining spin on that. But you know, when you think about a character that's been around for thousands of years, has just done hundreds of thousands of awful things. It's mm-hmm. like, well, you know, he does it in a charming way, and he's sort of motivated by self-interest and you know sort of sort of seems to be enjoying life it's just um you know he he strikes me as kind of like the uh the stoner little brother who sometimes manages to get something right but mostly just spends his time you know keeping himself entertained but uh you know that that would probably work in a, in a my name is earl kind of way yeah um and when it I mean, I mainly, I mainly bring up that, bring up that particular one because I remember, I remember when that, I remember when that show was going on, and the one of the, piv, one of the pivotal scenes early on was him trying to get a, him trying to, him trying to get a, um, for a old frenemy of his, um, it, his hitched, and he, he, he decides to, he decides to recommend him, to, recommend him a bar, but, um. It, he ends up accidentally sending it, sending the guy to a gay bar. <laughs> <laughs> well, he may end up getting hitched, but uh, may not go out as everybody planned. Yeah, and that's awesome. Oh, uh, but, <coughs> but when, but I do, th- I, I, but with the, with that kind of thing in mind, one thing I, one thing I'd like to ask you about, given you brought up web, given you brought up web comics, um. What's your what's your stance on the on the growing um the growing web platforms that have been, that have been making waves over the last few years like Webtoon? Uh, I think I had I may actually still have a, a web comic on Webtoon. Um, the digital audiences like Webtoon or the people on Tapas, mm-hmm. or even you know some of the people that are reading on Comixology and, and their sites about to shut down so that you you're just going to be shopping through the Amazon portal if you're if you're doing it from a desktop or a laptop um, that audience is more like the audience for manga you know the audience for digital comics doesn't give two fucks who who the third Robin is you know they show up and they will read a book they will read a comic like um, like Dragon's Head, which mm-hmm. is survivor manga. You know, they'll read something like, you know, my my boyfriend kills monsters and we don't get together and have dates on Thursdays anymore. You know, they will they will read very you know, there there's there's sports mangas, there's slice of life mangas. It's a it's a very different different uh category. I mean, if you look at um if you look at Katie Cook's long running webcomic whose name escapes me at the second at the moment, you know, a character class in her webcomic is deceased vegetables. There are radish ghosts flying around talking with people in that book. And, you know, you would never pitch that to, you know, Warner Brothers or Disney, you know. So it's uh, the thing about webcomics is that they're wildly creative. And the, the, the problem that they have to, an, to a large extent mm-hmm. is to have a whole lot of people stick with their projects for a long time because, you know, it's – it's easy to kind of dip in and dip out because you don't really have a commitment to or from a publisher or to or from an audience. Like, hey, here's my new thing. Hope you like it. Mm-hmm. You know, it's uh, so it, the thing that the thing that I like is that there's people at all skill levels, um, and there's things that you can just duck in and get a good laugh at and wander off. And there, are th- and then there are people that are just building very long, very involved histories. Uh, I think that. To a large extent, that's sort of where the um, that's sort of where the medium is going. Because you know, if you, I've been working on a on a project with this guy Stephen Cummings, who's a great artist, Mm -hmm. and he did the Wayward Book for Image about the the Japanese teens fighting demons in in modern Tokyo, and you know, it's not a book I would have read. It's not not exactly my wheelhouse. I'm more of a mystery slash crime reader uh, on a good day. But you know, I picked it up and very, very, uh, very well executed, very entertaining book. It was just not something I thought I would enjoy, so I didn't pick it up. But it's a great book. 
but you know we're working on a on an offbeat superhero thing and i said you know who could we pitch this to where we would actually still keep the characters and you know we came up with a short list and we were working on something and then you know steven got hired to go do a five issue uh star wars thing for marvel Mm -hmm. but uh you know making web comics is the freest thing in the world because they're just about no rules. You know, if you, if you work, uh, I'd, I'd sold DC, a, uh, a justice league unlimited story. I sold it to him. Eventually I knew the guy who was overseeing the kids line, the kids comics line at the time. I think I had to pitch him something like 10 or 15 ideas before he found one. He said, well, I guess that one doesn't suck. Work on that a little bit and we can talk. Yeah. <coughs> but it's, uh, you know, thanks. <laughs> there are just so many gatekeepers when you're dealing with a, you know, multi billion dollar property management publishing company. And there's just zero gatekeepers in, in web comics. So that, you know, I, I know that there's a lot of people that are going out and doing their thing. And now they're doing it with great big fat uh, grants from Substack. So. You know, the latest thing to come out of that is I think that Hickman interviewed Grant Morrison on his Substack channel and early supporters as, as at a certain level got to got to watch that live. Mm-hmm. So, you know, it's it's the it's the it's the river of creativity flowing right around the dams that corporations have built. So I think that's a terribly healthy thing to do. Yeah. Um, it's funny. It's funny you bring up Grant Morrison because I've. I've um I've nicknamed Morrison um um especially especially during all during his various DC runs DC's absent-minded professor. Yeah, cuz he know he there is no denying that he knows his stuff when it comes to mm. D, when it comes to DC he goes he goes into minutia that even that even I fi- that even I find a little excessive. <laughs> yeah. But he has this bad habit of kind of, of kind of getting lost in his own head, and the DC that he that he's thinking about isn't the actual DC. Well, I think people are afraid to edit him because you know he's such a big name in the world of comics. Mm-hmm. You, uh, I don't think that you know. I think an, a good editor asks you questions to make you think about your work to make the work better. But I'm not sure that there's anybody there uh, at either one of the big publishers that would question him a whole lot because frankly i'm sure that he shows up with a whole lot of a whole lot of merchandise you mm-hmm. know he shows up and if you look at um his reboot on x-men you know from 15 20 years ago uh the books that he did with uh with quietly those books were great and he showed up and created a whole bunch of new characters and it was it was it was generally went pretty well <laughs> and then you know if you if you look at the way that morrison works he built a multiversity for DC to use and they promptly decided not to, you know, I think that the thing to come to do coming out of a project like multiversity is say, okay, this earth here is the faucet earth. We're going to do a, um, faucet book that has, you know, Mary, Mary Marvel stories. And we're going to have, you know, the, the mind worm stories and the, the adventures of the Sylvana family, and it'll come out quarterly and we'll throw out some new concepts and see if it works. But instead it was, you know, Grant Morrison says, behold, I have all these worlds. And they're like, yeah, that's cool. What happens mm-hmm. next month in Batman? You know, I mean, they, uh, you know, the, the corporations are there to make money. They're not necessarily, not necessarily there to see how much money they can make by being wildly creative. It's more like, how can we make people buy more Batman comics? And, um, well, that well that can well that can work well that can work to an extent. Um, event you can o- you can only do you you can only do, you can only do so much with with one ki- with one character. True. Um. And event and event eventually um eventually fatigue fatigue will set will set in um a buddy of a buddy of mine and I have a have a bit of a running gag where um. Where we ch- where we have a stopwatch whenever we discuss comics to see how long it takes before somebody ends up bringing up Batman. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, and in in my defense, the last time that this happened was because I was discussing the um, Dark Knight's Death Metal um, album, since one of the bands on it I'm familiar with is Health. 
Nice. Uh, but well, the, the the two companies have decided to do that. They've, you know, rather than exploring kind of the the entire world that these characters live in, they've decided to, you know, make their living on a handful of them. You know, you've got all those Spider-Man titles over here and all these Batman titles over there. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, sucks up a lot of oxygen in the room. So you and, really need a, you know, look, look at what happens when somebody shows up with a kind of wildly creative, inventive look at something that nobody knew they wanted to look at. And I'm talking about the book saga again, because, mm-hmm. you know, they, they keep talking about, you know, working on it, getting it back out. But, uh, you know, DC and Marvel are going to do what they do. Yeah. Um, although, if all I all I can all I can really all I can really do is is um is is at the end is at the end of the day what because of the because of the way the market seems to be going these days is laugh. Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, I'm I'm interested in telling th- telling stories and doing things that are that are entertaining, that entertain me, that entertain the audience, and maybe have a uh, a life outside of comics. Mm-hmm. Uh, I was I was at the I was at that Bell County show mm-hmm. uh, a couple of weeks ago. Hold on a second, please. Yeah, my uh, my my voice is losing some uh, some traction here. <laughs> but at the Bell County show, I sat down and had I had a talk with uh, Ben Dunn, and we were talking about that. And he he's pretty big, pretty much a big evangelist now of doing something different with comics. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, he had done, uh, I don't know, 150, 175 issues of Ninja High School. And we were talking about what he's working on going forward. And he said, you know, I'm looking to create things that have a uh, kind of a, a real pop to them, that, that they feel kind of immediate, the kind of thing you have to read. I want them set in a modern world. And I want to have a very low production budget in case we can get something onto Netflix. And, you know... That is that is a very viable approach to making comics, mm-hmm. because independent producers spend a lot of time looking for properties that they can adapt to other medium. Because, you know, you just look over and say, "Oh, so Avengers made how many billions of movie billions of dollars?" Yeah, I can see doing that. Yeah, and with and with with that kind of with that kind of thing in mind. Um, because I because this tr- this trend to- this trend towards more and more independence I think the um I think the snowball has already started to roll down the hill and and it's not um it's not st- it's not stopping anytime soon um well you've got people that are kind of naysayers saying well you know the uh, all the air is going to go out of this balloon nobody's going to give a crap about your your C list characters and you know. That uh, Shang Chi movie debuts this weekend, and it did pretty good numbers on uh, Thursday night. I don't know how the numbers have done since then, but I think that this will probably prove a lot of people wrong. It's like, well, people are excited about a Moon Knight TV show. Five years ago, nobody know who the knew who the fuck that was. Um, you know, there's there's a thing where these Marvel Marvel has become a brand. And as long as they have somebody there who's smart, who keeps them on brand, I think they'll keep having luck. Yeah. I know, I know it's I know it's completely unlikely to happen, but there's a small part of me that would li- that would like to that would like to see um, the that Moon Knight ver- that version of Moon Knight take some cues from uh, Warren Ellis's run. I think that might happen. Uh, it is certainly a different take on it, mm-hmm. and I think it's a little more digestible than cheering for a character who's got at least three personalities. You know, if you, if you have a guy who says, you know, I, I work for this, you know, angry God, nobody's heard of. And I put on this mask and I, you know, beat up people who take advantage of my people. The end. I mean, that's, that's, that's essentially Batman, you know, and in this case, Moon Knight protects travelers and, you know, uh, Batman protects Gotham. You know, I mean, there's a it's it's a very simple, but I think probably manageable story engine there. Mm-hmm. And with the and when 
when it comes when it comes to that kind when it comes to that kind of naysaying, um, oh, the reason that I I call back to um to the experiment with Unity, um, of putting yeah. of putting an issue zero out for free, which from what from what I from what I've been told and from what I've from what I've read about the mat about the matter, everyone and their mother told 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 Valiant that wasn't gonna work. Issue mm. zero issue zeros barely wor barely worked as it is, and put and putting one out for free like that was not was going to was going to result in a negative. And yet and yet um, the and yet Unity itself af after that ended up having the exact opposite um, go down. Yeah. Well, I think didn't Unity happen a few years before Free Comic Book Day? Because now yes. you've got the companies launching big storylines out of Free Comic Book Day because they know that, you know, our uh, punchline was Antarctic Press's uh, 2019 Free Comic Book Day book, and and we shipped I think 50,000 units, mm -hmm. and you know if you can in a no cost way get 50,000 comics into people's hands, that makes that's a big deal. I mean. At full price, fifty thousand comic sales puts you, you know, pretty squarely in the uh, in the hit range for the uh, for the big publishers now. Yeah. So you know, helps to get a running start and a and a good introduction to that market. Yeah, free comic book day started in two thousand two. So yes. Yep. So you know, Shooter, I think had good ideas. Maybe he still does. And I think that uh, you know he was, he, yeah. I keep seeing him at shows, and he just looks sad. And you know, when people talk to him, he's just you know, kind of burned out and pissed off. And I think that uh, I feel, I, think that it, I feel like the pla I feel like the plasm thing um, did a lot more damage to him than a lot of people realized. Well, I think that he was afraid to be idle because he jumped from one to another to another. You know. He jumped from you know from one place to successively smaller publishers, mm -hmm. and you know in terms of full disclosure, uh, I was in a studio with Keith Wilson and Bill Willingham, and I think I did backgrounds on some of the Ditko pages for the Defiant, like uh, trading card build your own comic thing that that he did. So you know I was I was at the periphery of that for a while, and I think there was a Plasm annual. That I may have inked backgrounds on at some point when I was working for Keith. Uh, I started out making comics, uh, doing backgrounds for Keith Wilson over uh, Chris Browse's pencils on the Hammerlock miniseries from DC. But um, yeah, it, it's one of those things where, you know, if you get canned, maybe take six months to a year if you can afford it and come up with real, some really good core concepts and then you sit down and talk sit down and talk with your money people and see what you can't do mm -hmm. um and go from there but you know i keep seeing uh okay i inked some pages on batman 66 meets wonder woman 77 over david hahn david requested me and i you know i owe him a huge favor at some point he, uh, but the guy that I worked with over there is a guy named Rob Levin, mm -hmm. and Rob is now the new executive in charge over at uh, Valiant, and I hope he has good luck. But you know, people have been trying to sell those Valiant characters for twenty some odd years now, and uh, I hope they can find a way to sell Magnus and whatever else that they own over there. But, oof, you know, you, it just, it, I, I just appreciate the balls to come in and say. Yeah, all those other people that tried to launch these these projects before me, they didn't know what they're doing. Let me, you know, crack my fingers and show them how it's done. It's like, man, that that takes some stones. Well, I never I never would have thought we'd get a would get, we'd get a bloodshot movie in my lifetime, but here we are. Yeah, true. Um, yeah, and that's that's the thing about uh, comic book related movies doing so well and making so much money that there will be. You know, there will be screenwriters writing that kind of stuff. And there will be venture capital guys going, well, you know, if we throw $50 million at it and borrow another 50 and we can get it made and get it in front of people, there's a good chance we can make some money back and blah, blah, blah. I mean, that's, uh, that's, the, uh, that's the high cost of optimism when it comes to adapting some of these things. But, you know, maybe, uh, maybe they get lucky on the next one. Who knows? Mm -hmm. 
and with the and with the with that with that said, um, I do want I do want to take a I do I do want to give to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to come all the way up to the temple and enjoy the madness that go that goes on around here. I like the decorating. I like what you've done with the temple. <laughs> And um, anytime you anytime you see fit, whether it's to further go into punchline, to to go into supers RPGs, or or just to or just to um, just to just to laugh at some of the ridiculousness that ha that happened in the silver and bro and bronze age. So oh yeah, Lord, some of those ideas. If um, you look at the covers from the Bronze Age of comics, especially Spider Man comics, there's a whole bunch of people standing back and pointing and you would imagine laughing at Spider Man getting his ass whooped. Mm -hmm. You know? <laughs> if you check the backgrounds of those, there's always people pointing going, Oh no, what's happening to Spider Man this week? I love those. Yeah. And as I always say around here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. It should be. Because <laughs> life is absurd and you don't get out of it alive. So yeah, go have some fun. Mm -hmm. And of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. And there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here, on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra, I am your gimming monk, stay fucking frosty everybody! <laughs>